This is the golden era of the Four Seasons, Part Two. We're here with Bob Gaudio, Joe Long, Dimitri Callas, and Frankie Valley, hearing their words, their story, and their music. The year is 1964. Musically, the Beatles and countless other groups have invaded the American music chart. Guys, what do you remember about it, and how did you think it would affect the Four Seasons? Uh, well, <clears throat> well, I remember at one point the Beatles were one, two. And we were three with Dawn, and the Beatles were four and five. <laughs> so it was a little confining. Mm -hmm. You were surrounded by good company. Yes, I'd say so. I was, I, I was still a year, that was still a year before I was to join the group, so I, was, I could remember looking at the Four Seasons as an outsider. And uh, it seemed to me that uh, the Seasons were the only American group at that time that were able to buck the English trend. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I was pretty involved in music myself, and I could, I, I used to look at the charts or listen to the radio, and I, I got to feel uh, a, a little down that the American groups were just not knocked by the wayside, but the Four Seasons were the only American group that were able to sustain the British invasion. I think also uh, the Beach Boys were still pretty Yeah, I guess together. the Beach Boys were. They had a couple yeah. hits I remember during that whole time. Did any of you ever meet the Beatles or the Rolling Stones? Frankie uh, spent the day with the Beatles when he went to Rome on vacation. Uh, the Stones, I don't know if you, I've never met the Stones, no. Frankie, what do you remember of your meeting with the Beatles? Well, I met the Beatles when, uh, when they were pretty much together uh, as a group and head-wise. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were really out of sight. I really had a very enjoyable time. Now a decision was made to leave a relatively small but successful label, VJ, and finally sign with Phillips. What was the story behind it? Money. <laughs> it's that simple. Uh, uh, we weren't too thrilled with the way the payments were and so on and so forth. There were some problems, uh, accounting problems as to how many records were sold, how many we thought it sold, how many they thought it sold. And uh, it just got to be a very uncomfortable situation. So we went into a litigation, and uh, we managed to get all our tapes back, all the masters, mm -hmm. which were then later released on uh, Phillips and Gold albums. The first Phillips release was one of the all-time Four Seasons greats, Dawn, in February 1964. I just remember being very... In fact, we had that song recorded before we made the deal with Phillips. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was terrible just to sit on it for as long as we had to. I mean, to know we had something in the can that we felt was a top ten record and, and not be able to put it out because of the litigation between record companies. Right. It wasn't long after that B.J. released your version of the old Maurice Williams hit, Stay. Did this surprise you? Uh... No, we, in fact, we were kind of excited. Uh, yeah. Nobody had any animosity about the fact that Phillips had, uh, VJ had re-released the record because it was kind of interesting because we had, at that time, I think it was Dawn or one of the others that was in the top 10 plus Stay, I think, was a top 20 record. So we had two going at the same time. It was great. Frankie, do you feel that your association with Bob Crew led to your initial success and then your continued success? Uh, I think uh, for talented people, success at one time or another is inevitable. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the right combination of things, the right chemistry. And uh, whether it would have been with Bob Crew or or any other producer. I think it was, you know, which is bound to happen. Bob, your second album for Phillips was Born to Wonder. I got the impression that Phillips was attempting to change your image. Either they were going for a folk group or a copy of the Beach Boys, especially with No Serpent Today. The Born to Wonder album is terrible. Oh, that was, I, I, you know, I'll tell you the truth. I don't even really remember what possessed us to get into that whole thing because it wasn't our bag and we were just experimenting a little bit and it came out fairly decent and we put it out, but it was not really us. And it was 
Okay. As an example, we have one of the folk cuts off of that album, written by you and Bob Crew, called Searchin' Wind. Another one of the cuts from the album was not a hit for the seasons, but for another group three years later. The song is Silence is Golden, again written by Bob Gaudio and Bob Crew. Oh, don't it hurt. Frankie's falsetto voice effect has received quite a bit of comment. Has he always used it in the season's recording? I don't know where he picked it up because I didn't know him when he first started singing, but ever since I've known him, he's been into the falsetto. Uh, we've done a couple of comedy things, and we had done one uh, before we became Four Seasons in clubs. Uh, he did a takeoff on Rose Murphy well, and so on and so forth. I remember Frankie before the seasons, uh, when we were all working locally in Jersey, and I remember him, you mentioned the Rose Murphy... Uh, yeah. Takeoff. I remember him doing that mm -hmm. back in the middle 50s. Uh, Rose Murphy was, I don't know if your listeners are familiar but she, with her, but she was a, a real fine jazz singer. Right. And she had this little tiny, tiny, high pitched voice. Right. And so distinctive uh, that she used cute little catchphrase phrases like chi chi and things like that, you know. And Frankie used to do a, 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 an impersonation of her that was incredibly realistic, uh, you know, beautiful. So uh, I guess he was fooling around with the falsetto sound, uh, all was professionalized. What Bob did, though, Bob uh, took advantage of the sound, because I guess in the back of Bob's head, he, he heard a, a group being formulated around that sound. Uh, so uh, Fra Frankie's been using the sound for many, many years, mm -hmm. just through Bob's uh, ingenuity that uh, they were able to marry it to uh, the rest of the season. Is that the way it was, Frankie? Right, it was, it was really a tongue-in-cheek kind of thing. Fun. Uh, and uh, the nightclub singer's name was Rose Murphy. <laughs> Did they? had several hits with that particular song. And uh, the way it first happened in the studio was just, just by accident. I was just clowning when we were doing a rundown. And next thing you know, they said they wanted to take it that way. The next single release by the seasons was Roddy in May. I remember, uh, <laughs> it was funny, when I wrote that with Bob Grew, uh, we, were, we had written the song for someone else. And uh, Frankie happened to walk in, as he usually does when we're writing, to see if he's going to get anything good. Uh, we didn't really feel that that was a Four Seasons single, or or should be recorded by the Four Seasons, but, you know, Frankie flipped over it so much that he forced the issue, and uh, we eventually recorded it and released it. The next single was another VJ release in May, alone, that the Shepherd Sisters had done in the 1950s. Had you done a series of oldies or oldie albums for VJ? Uh, yeah, we did an album uh, for VJ. I don't, I don't remember the name of it, but it was, it was a whole bunch of old, old tunes. The next Phillips release had to be the biggest single record the group ever had. In July, you had Rag Doll. Tell us about it. That was a fantastic $5 investment oh, that crazy. paid off very well. Uh, in New York, on the uh, west side, as you're coming into the city, there's one traffic light that must be a minute and a half. Now, when the cars pull up, there's little kids that come and clean off your windows with rags. They never do a very good job, but you give them some change or something. And this one particular time I had been going into the city, uh, this little girl came over. It was the first time I ever saw a girl. And I didn't have any change at all. You know, I just couldn't find anything. And the smallest bill I had was a five dollar bill, and I just could not just leave her and not give her anything, you know. So I gave her a five dollar bill, and the look on her face stayed with me for the rest of the week. And she looked like exactly what the song said. <laughs> Do 
Did you know that there was a female group named after that record, the Rag Dolls? And they had a hit record called Dusty? I didn't know somebody did. Did they? Oh, really? It's very nice. <laughs> oh, I feel great now. <laughs> It's funny that you didn't remember the record. Bob Crew wrote it, along with Sandy Linzer and Denny Rendell, who wrote many of your hits, and it was produced by Charlie Kellio, your producer. What changes in the music do you feel took place between 1962 and, and 1964, other than the Beatles? Well, I, I don't think you can exclude it. That, yeah, that is the that change. Was. Yeah, it kind of went backward for about a year, it seems to me into the Chuck Berry thing and, and so on and so forth. And then as the Beatles progressed, everybody sort of went along with them. It was kind of an interesting turnaround. They came on the scene doing what everybody else had done five or six years earlier. And then uh, within a year, everybody was doing what they were doing. You know, They just set the whole business on, on, you know, turned it right around. The next four season single on Phillips was a record called Save It For Me in September, 1964. Let's ask Frankie about it. I think that, uh, in my opinion, I think it's one of the best songs we've ever done. It happens to be one of my very favorites. Uh, I like the message of the song. The melodic structure of the music itself. The next single release was on BJ in October 1964. It was a record called Apple of My Eye. It's a funny story. That song was originally a hit by Frankie Valli. <laughs> yeah, it was. that was the Four Lovers. Right. They had a number one record with that. I don't have any idea when. Uh, it was many, many years ago. 57, 57 or 58. And we recorded it again when we... VJ released it, the same voice, and released a different record, but the same voice. Most of the previous season's albums contained mostly remakes of old rock hits, some of which did become hits for your group. The current album at the time, Ragdoll, contained mostly original material with hit potential. Another cut from the Ragdoll album was a potential hit called On Broadway Tonight. The next Four season single was released in November 1964. That was Big Man in Town. <laughs> what would you like to know about that? <laughs> Other than the fact that I feel it was a horrible record. I don't know. It just it it was one of those songs that we thought we had a a good foundation to go in and record, but for some reason the session didn't come together. You know, it, it was just one of those things where it, it didn't seem to feel right when it was done. We released it anyway because it again a uh, situation where we didn't have anything else at the time. But I don't think anybody really felt that it was really a, a, a thing that we could really be proud of. It just wasn't completely together. By the end of 1964, the main thrust of the Beatle British invasion is over, and while most other groups are in shambles, the Four Seasons remain unscathed and, if anything, stronger than ever. Why do you think the Beatles were so influential? I was uh, satisfied in going backwards along with them, you know. Uh, I mean, it wasn't backwards for them because that's what they were into at the time. And in a way, it was refreshing, you know. But uh, I don't really think early, the early Beatles during the 64 and 65 year uh, didn't knock me out at all. I think from that point on, they blew my mind every time they put a record out, you know, uh -huh. but uh, the early year, the first year, I didn't really, but everybody else seemed to. 
you know, I think everybody just went along with it and got into it. Uh, well, I, I, I have no answer for it. You know, it was just a matter of they hit this country, like, so hard. I don't think anybody had any choice. I mean, I can imagine all the groups that are working locally must have had requests for days to do their thing. So, I mean, everybody just kind of fell right into it. Let me ask you this. Have they influenced your writing at all? No, not in the early days. They have since. This brings us to the end of Chapter 2 of The Golden Era of the Four Seasons, 1964. We've heard their reaction to Beatlemania, why they changed record labels, explaining how the Frankie Valley falsetto voice effect started and sustained, and explained their way out of a questionable album. Next up, 1965, Chapter 3. Bob, Joe, Dimitri, and Frankie discuss the mystery member of the season, the actual new member of the group that year, and how it came about. Why the group was rarely publicized, and we wonder who else we might encounter next as we talk with the most fantastic group in the world, the subjects of the golden era of the Four Seasons. Mm -hmm.